we're in the simulator here. We're uh, on the descent. It is the exact flight path. Uh, if you want to see this and you have a VR headset, if you want to see this in 3D, hop on over to Flying for Money in 3D, and uh, you can see this in 3D over there. If not, you're in the right place. So this is the exact flight path on the way to Moan Airport. It was a departure out of Bangkok, and uh, it's in the descent here, just sitting through 10,000 feet on its way to unfortunately striking birds and then having a little bit of an issue after that uh, circling around to uh, land belly up in uh, Muan Airport and unfortunately went off the end and you've seen the video I think most of you probably have it crashed into the wall at the end of the runway. So there's a few systems aboard the aircraft that become relevant here later on we're going to describe them now as the aircraft continues along the flight path. Again this is based off of ADSB data. The aircraft sends information to satellites and the satellites transmit that information to air traffic controllers then they can keep uh, air traffic separated from each other so there's no aerial collisions but there are public companies such as Flight Radar 24 which is where I got this information from that uh, grabs that information as well. It's publicly available and then they keep a record of all the flights that are taking place on planet Earth at all times. This data will stop once the airplane gets to about 500 feet above the ground on the first approach. There's no data after that. Uh, there's some question about why there isn't. Flight Radar 24 has stated that previous flights continued to send data until they were parked at the gate. And uh, so the feeling is the bird strike probably occurred somewhere around 500 feet. I'm not sure if there was an electrical issue that may have knocked out the transponder. I know in an early report there was a suggestion that the transponder, which is right here, so you see this number 1234 on the transponder, uh, there was a suggestion that they had squawked what's called 7700. So if that number is 7700-7700, then it's, it uh, tells ATC that's an emergency aircraft. So if you declare an emergency, you don't really need to put 7,700 in there, but there was a suggestion they'd put 7,700 in there. So if they had hit the birds, declared the emergency, and decided to what we'd call squawk 7,700, um, it would have ceased to uh, be depicting itself as this particular flight, as Jeju Air 2216. When you go to 7700, that's a, that's a discrete number. So it's possible that the birds it struck more than one bird, and some of the birds that struck hit one of the antennas that goes to the transponder. There's a possibility they had something like a dual engine failure. It doesn't seem likely because it looks like the number two engine is still producing thrust, albeit perhaps at a reduced power setting. I covered this on, on a few earlier videos. You can see what looks like a uh, compressor stall, a flame that shoots out of the number one engine from uh, it looks like an iPhone video from the ground. We'll talk about that a little bit because you can sort of see the shoreline as you get close to the airport, Juan Airport, where that was recorded from. In any case, we're going to talk about a few components here that are important. So it landed gear up. This right here is the gear selector. This is a normal position for it as the off position. And then uh, when you select it down, you select it into the down position. So you take this handle, you put it down here. That'll command the gear down. You'll see three red lights here initially indicating that the gear is in transit and then they'll turn to three green as soon as the gear is in the down and locked position. Pretty sure on the first approach that the gear was down uh, at 500 feet you should be in your final landing configuration really by a thousand feet at the latest you should be in your final landing co configuration which will be geared down. We have a flap gauge that you can see right up here and that's the flap gauge and uh, it's got two, these are degrees so one degrees of flaps two five ten fifteen twenty five thirty forty that corresponds with the flap handle here so you select uh, the flaps that you want on here and then the gauge will tell you that it's actually moved into that position they're also leading edge uh, devices they're called slats and most other jets some of them are called slats in the 737 but they also call them leading edge flaps so it's the leading edge flaps, leading edge slats, uh, and then the trailing edge. They usually go down together. But So the gear handle is what you're going to use, the flaps you're going to use. As you slow down, you're going to go through different settings. The airline that uh, I fly for, flaps one will be the first setting will start uh, below 240 knots. Then we'll go to flaps five. Uh, generally from there, we'll do gear down, flaps 15. The reason we do gear down at flaps 15 is because at flaps 15, if you have reduced thrust, as you generally will during a descent, uh, you'll get the gear warning horn. It'll start to uh, howl at you and make a noise at you. So I usually just put the gear down as we go to flaps 15 so we don't get that gear warning horn. That again becomes a little bit relevant 
as they made the turn back to the runway because uh, as long as they had normal electrical system functioning, they just needed one generator to be turning, then they would have gotten that gear warning horn as they got close to the ground uh, below 800 feet. Um, with any flap setting, they would have gotten that gear warning horn. Uh, but it'll do it at 15 at any altitude with just a reduced power setting, flaps 15, you'll get the gear warning horn. And then we usually go from there to flaps 25, flaps 30, and then a lot of times we'll land flaps 30, sometimes on short runways, and some pilots just prefer flaps 40, so you might do flaps 40. So the landing gear is on the A hydraulic pump, and the flaps are on the B hydraulic pump. So the A hydraulic pump, these two pumps right here are the A hydraulic. You can see it says A hydraulic there. Uh, it's engine one and then electric two, but that makes up the A hydraulic. So one engine driven pump, one electric pump. The B system is an electric pump, engine driven pump. Engine driven pumps are the primary pumps. They flow the most hydraulic fluid. They can power all the systems all by themselves. If you have an engine failure or an engine driven pump failure, then the backup uh, electric pump, which is always on in flight, will just take over the load. Now they flow about one sixth the amount of hydraulic fluid as the engine driven pumps do. So they can sometimes have a little bit more of an issue with high draw items and high draw items of flaps on the B system is a high draw hydraulic item and the gear on the A system is a high draw hydraulic item. So they'll get a little bit of assistance. There's an architecture that allows a transfer of fluid pressure from one side to the other to assist in gear retraction principally and then in uh, flap operation in the event that you lose an engine driven pump on one side. But all of the systems should work without the pilots have to having to do anything. So if you have an engine pump failure, an engine failure, um, which would also result in the failure of an engine driven pump, the operation of the gear and the flaps should be pretty seamless. Pilots don't have to do anything. You put the gear handle down, the gear will go down. You put it up, it'll come up, flaps, you select what flaps you want, and the flaps and the slats, leading edge, trailing edge flaps, leading edge flaps, and the slats will all extend like they would on a normal approach. So with the flaps in the video that we see when the aircraft is getting down the runway, we can't really tell what the flaps setting are, but they don't look like they're either 30 or 40 degrees, which would be a normal flap setting. They look like they're less than that. It's possible they're 15 degrees. Uh, at a 15 degree setting, that would be a normal flap setting for an engine failure approach. Uh, flaps produce a lot of drag, particularly as you get down to 30 and 40 degrees. With uh, an engine failure, you've lost half your thrust. And in losing half your thrust, you lose actually about 80% of your performance. It sounds odd. Some of that thrust is just needed to overcome the drag from the air and then the other uh, little remainder of thrust is needed for performance, for climb performance, for example. So losing 50% of your thrust means you lose 80% of your performance, particularly your climb performance. You don't want to be carrying any more drag on the approach than you have to single engine. So it's possible they're at 15 degrees. It kind of looks like they, they really didn't have much flaps in at all or slats. Uh, which would be an odd configuration. It does appear as though they were cooking pretty fast. I know one of the commentators on YouTube had done a calculation, the amount of time from the end of the runway till they hit the berm, and then you know the distance there is a couple hundred meters. They're able to figure out something like 150 knots. It, it looks like that's about what it's doing when it, when it goes off the end. They were just under 4,000 feet down the runway when they touched down, a little over 9,000 foot long runway. So they would have had about a mile worth of runway uh, that they were skidding on before they went off. So if they went off at 150 knots, they probably touched down at something like 190, 200 knots. Maybe the wings were producing lift. There was a little bit of an angle of attack as the airplane skidded down the runway. And uh, that might indicate that they were, the wings were actually producing lift down the runway. Not enough to get the aircraft flying again so that it really wasn't slowing down much because there wasn't much friction. There are spoilers on the top of the wing. This is. Uh, uh, speed brake handle here that is supposed to automatically deploy once you've touched down but that automatic deployment is based upon wheel speed sensors and squat switches on the gear so if you don't land on the gear the spoilers will not deploy and what the spoilers do or the speed brakes do is they disrupt lift over the wings they're very 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 important um, when you're landing to have that those device those devices come up if you don't have them the landing distance on a dry runway 
at heavy weight with limited flaps is about 9,000 feet. If they touch down very early on the runway with gear and braking and all that stuff, there almost wouldn't have been enough runway for them to get the aircraft stopped within. So this back here is the alternate gear extension uh, compartment. We, are, we have the tendency to check this before every flight because if this panel is open, the gear will not retract. So you at least check to make sure the gear is closed. If you're checking it before every flight, you know where it is. If you need it, you should be familiar with it being back there. This is if you don't have hydraulic system A for some reason. You don't have either the electric pump or the main pump. That would principally occur during a uh, if you had a total electrical failure and you were on battery power. You wouldn't have either A or B systems. Neither one would be powered. You would have a backup, uh, what they call a standby hydraulic system that's uh, driven and that's powered up here. So the standby system is this uh, standby rudder is what they call it. And then the standby hydraulic system is indicated here. And then that system will actually power the leading edge flaps and slats. Uh, an electric motor will power the um, trailing edge flaps. So even in an electrical emergency, you can get the flaps and slats out, but you have to do it via the switch. You will pop that open. And then in there, you have a switch. You'll turn it down into the uh, arm position, and then you'll use a switch to select the flaps down. It takes a long time for them to come down. So you have to hold it down for you know, like 30 seconds to get them down. It takes a long time to get them down, but you can get them down if you need to, if you have an electrical emergency and you don't have hydraulic A or B systems. But for the gear, you have to do a uh, manual extension, which would be open that compartment up and then once you get inside that compartment, you can see that you have a handle for each of the gear. And the handle is connected to a cable, which runs down to the uh, gear and the uplock that holds the gear up. It simply just releases that uplock and then gravity does the rest. It also closes or opens the hydraulic valve, so hydraulic fluid will evacuate from that area so the gear won't be held up. It'll just fall down by gravity. Nose gear, in particular, aerodynamic loads will help to drive that into place. So you just pull those out and then um, the gear goes down. All right, so you can see as we're uh, overhead here, that's Muan. Muan, if you can see it out there, it's in the distance. You probably can't. We got city that we're going overhead here. We're coming down through 4,000 feet. So what we're going to do is as we get a little bit lower here on the approach, we're going to take us down to about 500 feet. We'll see that there appears to be a little jag where they sort of do a little bit of an aggressive descent and then they do a very aggressive climb and then they kind of level off. We're not entirely sure um, about all the details behind that. It appears to be maybe that point in time where they approach the birds. They may have tried to maneuver to avoid them. The climb may have been the first sort of go around attempt. And then as it started to level off, that may have indicated that they had had a loss of uh, thrust on the engines, perhaps loss of thrust on one engine and an engine failure on the other that didn't really allow them to climb that forced them five, six, 700 feet. 500 feet, they're pretty close to runway one and they would have been flying over the field and the quickest way around to land if they couldn't climb would have been to turn back to runway one nine, which is a turn that they made. Now, when you go around, the uh, call out is Go around toga flaps 15. So there's a button here that's called a toga button. You push that, thrust levers will come forward to give you climb thrust to get away from the ground and then gear up. Obviously, you're going to go from gear down to gear up to get rid of the drag of the gear. And then flaps 30 or 40 would be the normal uh, gear selection for landing. You'd bring them up. You can see there's a little gate right here that'll trap them at, at flaps 15, which is what you want initial for the climb. Get rid of the drag, but keep some flaps out there so that the wings keep producing lift. And then you can continue to clean up the flaps as you climb away if you want to. I, I would be sort of surprised if they cleaned it up from flaps 15. Maybe they did. If they were having a hard time climbing, they thought they needed to get rid of more drag. Flaps 15 would be kind of a normal place to leave the flaps uh, to try to climb at. And then if you couldn't climb out, then you just come back around and you land at flaps 15. So when they get the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder all synced up, we'll know what flaps they were at, if they were at flaps 15 or not. Uh, for that go around. And then when they came around, if they were flaps 15, they would have land, been landing a little bit fast. They may have been landing at the 170 knot sort of mark. And then when they touched down, unfortunately, they sort of settled back on the tail. 
Um, they were canted upwards a little bit, which would have produced lift on the wings, which obviously, if you're trying to stop an aircraft, isn't really what you want. They just get it down the runway. If they had pushed the nose down or if they would gotten the spoilers manually, you can extend the spoilers. Uh, they are hydraulically driven if you're on the standby system. In these uh, Dash 800s, these older Dash 800s, you can still command the speed brakes, and that's going to do a great job of slowing you down. Uh, if you don't have speed brakes, the Maxes actually don't have speed brakes if you don't have hydraulic systems, if you're in electrical emergency. And uh, they, it takes a lot, a lot of runway to stop with, without speed brakes. So the speed brakes would have done a lot to help them out. I don't know if it would have prevented the crash if they had gotten those speed brakes out or if they would gotten the nose down, but it certainly uh, wouldn't have been, it certainly wouldn't have hurt. It may have helped them out. So, and that, this is something that we're supposed to verify after every landing because there is a setting that you put this speed brake in. It's slightly back and that arms it for landing. You're supposed to do that. Now it should come back anyways, whether you arm it or not, it just takes a little bit longer but again, we always verify because they're so important for the rollout, for the distance. All our, all our calculations for landing are based upon this activating and, and putting all of the speed brakes and the ground spoilers out for landing. So because it's so important, we verify that it comes aft every single landing. We actually, the company I work for right now, I don't know how Jeju Air did it, but the company I work for right now, we verbalize it. The pilot monitoring will look down and verify that that's come back and say deployed. And if it does not deploy automatically, you reach down there and you deploy it. And so that seems to have been missed on this particular landing because the spoilers were clearly not deployed. Now, obviously they were in a very weird scenario. They touched down on their belly. They may not have been meaning to do that. That may have been a surprise to them. And so it appears that got missed, which is, it's unfortunate. It probably would have helped out a little bit, but uh, it is what it is. And then the gear, once again, you know, unless they had a total electrical failure, which it really doesn't appear at this point as though they did, it does look like the number two engine was producing thrust. You can see exhaust gases coming out of the engine in one of the videos as it approached the runway. And then you could also hear it. And you can see the thrust reverser open and you can hear it as, as the aircraft skids by on another video, which would indicate that the generator was turning unless it was damaged in the bird strike, the generator itself, which meant that they had electrical power. And uh, with electrical power, you have electric hydraulic pumps, and then that gear is going to come down naturally. So it's going to come down just putting the gear handle down. If they were in electrical emergency, then they have to remember to go to the back and do the gravity free fall, which I would be kind of surprised as quickly as this evolved, I'd be surprised if they remembered to do that. As we get closer here to 500 feet, this is pretty much a normal approach until I get 600, 500 feet. And then it starts to get uh, a little bit aggressive. It's not long after that, that data just disappears. You can see fairly close to the runway. You can also see in the video on the shoreline, either they were passing through birds or they saw birds approaching and they tried to avoid them. And they, they got a second uh, layer of birds. Altitude's climbing again. This is about the geographic distance they would have been from the runway. Uh, potentially, if you're gonna go around, left traffic is the typical traffic, so they may have been thinking about turning them to the left in order to give them left traffic coming back around to land on the same runway, runway one. But the crew, perhaps at some point, determined that they were not going to be able to make that runway. They may have been concerned because they weren't climbing very good and decided right turn around to runway 19 was their best option.